Okay, so uh, this is a poem by Mamangai. You know, Mamangai is a poet, novelist, uh, a folklorist, uh, an ethnographer. Like she, she has many feathers in her cap. She has worked a lot, done a lot, written a lot. Perhaps one of the you know uh, finest authors we have in the entire region. And this po this particular poem is, you know, uh, slightly difficult to understand because there are lots of elements which you would find in this poem, which are you know slightly uh, strange to you because the symbols and myths and images used are, you know, uh, local to the Adi tribe. But somehow I will try to you know simplify simplify everything. So let's first read the first stanza. From where I sit on the high platform, I can see the fairy lights crossing, crisscrossing crossing the big river. So first of all, let's discuss a little bit about the title of the poem. The title of the poem is The Voice of the Mountain. Since it is the voice of the mountain. Somehow we get the feeling that the speaker is going to be the mountain. And you will also notice uh, what, what you call that pathetic fallacy. Pathetic fallacy used by the poet. By that, I mean, you know, uh, human like attributes given to inanimate objects like dialogues, feelings dreams and even the mountain speaks so those human like you know uh, qualities are given to this natural object inanimate object like a mountain so from where i sit on the high plat platform uh, the high platform is the himalayan range because this is high above the you know uh, uh, mean sea level then the mountain sees ferries criss criss crossing the big river and the big river here is the siang river uh siang river is uh, the river which flows in uh, arunachal in in assam and rest of india it is called brahmaputra in in bangladesh it is called jamuna and in the Tibet region, it is called Sangpo, right? So when the Sangpo, ri Sangpo River enters the territory of Arunachal and becomes Siang, that particular area is the Adi territory, the Adi tribe. And Mamangai belongs to the Adi tribe. You may call the tribe as Abotani, whatever name you want to refer to, that's up to you. So, and since the poet talks about the mighty river, reaching the ocean later in the poem, the river, the big river is the river which flows towards Bangladesh becomes Jamuna and joins the Bay of Bengal. I know the towns, the estuary mouth, they are beyond the last bank where the color drains from heaven. I can outline the chapters of the world. So in the second stanza, the mountain informs us that it knows the names of the towns situated alongside the you know, uh, fertile banks of the river, and, and also where the river meets the ocean, which the poet calls uh, the, the last bank. And there, the mountain can outline the chapters of the world. There, the colors drip from the sky and the fall of all on the ocean terraces, plenty of plethora of colors, uh, 
in the sky as as well as on the ocean. So by the chapters of the world, the poet is talking about migrations, settlements, the rise and fall of dynasties and empires, wars, battles, and, and all the other trials and tribulations of life that has happened you know, alongside the banks of this mighty river. And, uh, and you know, uh, the point is also talking about very Indian things like villages, uh, villages cropping up alongside the banks and being wiped out in the next flood. These things keep on happening, okay? So in fact, you know, the mountain has seen great developments to small losses, that has taken place alongside the reverse two banks. In the in the third stanza, somehow the voice of the ancient mountain changes. Okay. So far, the ancient mountain was talking about, you know, uh, things that happened in the past of bygone era. Then all of a sudden, uh, the time frame changes and it talks about something that happened very recently, like yesterday. All right. So uh, the poet writes, the other day, a young man arrived from the village because he could not speak. He brought a gift of fish from the land of rivers. It seems such acts are repeated. We live in territories forever ancient and new, and we speak in changing languages. I also lick my spear leaning by the tree and try to make a sign. So this young man comes from the land of rivers. The land of rivers is, as I told you, the Adi territory. So he he comes bearing gifts for the mighty mountain. What is this gift? Fish. He brings fish because fish is available in abundance in the land of rivers. It is also customary for many, you know, uh, ethnic tribes in the region to offer back what you receive from nature. So this ritual of offering is you know, uh, there. And this, in this case, this young man comes <coughs> bearing the gift of fish. Why is there? Because unfortunately, the young man cannot speak. So he comes for his blessings. He feels that if he makes this offering, says the prayers, do the ritual, then maybe you know, uh, uh, Mighty Mountain will grant him his wish to speak again. But the poet also tells us that he's not the only one who comes there for blessings. You will find this line here. It seems such eggs are repeated. But the poet is not sure. The poet says it seems. There is no matter of fact tone used by the point here. She's saying it seems, oh, maybe, you know, this, this act is repeated time and again. Why she is using this particular phrase, it seems, is for the fact that such stories are recounted, repeated, and narrated. So she has received everything from the, the past generations as stories, you know? So that's the reason why she is, you know, using this particular phrase. And people who lack something turn to the mountain for, for they believe that the mountain can heal them, the mountain has curative powers. Then, the poet says, my voice, sorry, 
We live in territories forever ancient and new. And uh, as we speak in changing languages, I also leave my spear leaning by the tree and uh, try to make a sign. So the not so certain attitude of the poet changes to the very certain statement, which is we live in territories forever ancient and new. So here, Mamang is talking about two different territories. And here, she is speaking through the second you know, uh, speaker in the poem. The first speaker is, of course, the mountain. Then you have voices, different voices here and there who would be speaking uh, in this particular poem. So in this case, the speaker is a man, not a woman. This is going to be very important towards the end of the you know poem. So this man talks about first the the physical territory. Remember the territory which the Adi tribe has developed a special relationship from from the very beginning, from ancient times to the present. Here, Mamang is talking about migration settlement, migration resettlement, remigration, which takes place, okay, from time to time. And the second territory that the poet is talking about is the domain of ancient myths and the legends associated with that physical territory. That is a special relationship which I was talking about. Since you are there, you know, you you give them names, uh, then you you associate your stories with the, with particular trees, flowers, gorges, lakes, dales, hill ranges. So myths and legends developed in and around that particular area, which is the you know uh, the mountain itself. So like the mountain. The peoples and the communities settling in and around also start speaking languages which are ancient and new. So changing languages means the changes which have taken place in the spheres of traditions, faith systems, myths, worldviews, and ideas. Then all of a sudden, the poet says, I also leave my spear leaning by the tree and I try to make a sign. So I who leaves the spear leaning by the tree is not a woman, is a man. Right? So the symbolism, symbolism involved is the act of living the old ways of life or the abandonment of the old ways of life or the new way of life. That's the symbolism here. So the, the, the spear is uh, symbolic of hunting, wars, fought for gaining territory or protecting territory. So what the point is trying to say here is that as the world around the Adi territory changes, there is also a growing demand for changes in the Adi community. What is that expression? Uh, sailing, with, sailing with the waves. You have, to, you have to change according to the tide of time. So by abandoning the spear, the person lowers his guard but at the same time, he tries to make a sign. So the phrase make a sign only suggests that he is trying to mark his territory. That's interpretation number one. Marking the territory. Okay, this is my territory. Then the second interpretation is the abandonment of all ways and welcoming of new ways of life so by that i mean 
change in the faith system, adoption of new religions, and the make signs, make a sign can also mean folded hands for prayer in the Hindu, uh, Hindu uh, custom, and the sign of the cross in case of Christianity. Then we move on to the next stanza, which is stanza number four. It reads, I'm an old man sipping the breeze that is forever young. In my life, I have lived many lives. My voice is sea waves and the mountain peaks. In the transfer of symbols, I am the sound syllable that orders the world, instructed with history and miracles. Again, in this particular stanza, the voice is, of course, the voice of the mountain again. So the mountain says that it is like an old man who is, you know, breathing the breeze, breeze which is fresh and forever young. Again, it goes on to say that even even if I am old, I am rejuvenated by the fresh wind, and when the summer comes. Oh, in this manner, you know, the mountain has lived many different lives and many different epochs and generations. Therefore, he can speak many languages, including the language of the sea. That's what he says. My voice is sea waves. He can also speak the language of the mountain peaks. So in the transfer, in the transfer of symbols. I am the chance level that orders the world, instructed with history and miracles. So the mountain, mountain can speak anything in between the two extremes, the sea and the mountain peak, and anything in between. And at the same time, it is also the chance syllable so the voice you know which speaks the language of the sea and mountain and also acted as the chant syllable in the transfer of symbols which separated the worlds the firmaments so what the point is saying here is that the mountain acted as the agent which separated the historical world from the mythic world, the historical time from the mythic times, from the world of miracles to the world of hard facts and the realities. This is the fifth stanza. I'm the desert and the rain, the wild bird that sits in the west, the past that recreates itself, and the particles of life that clutch and cling for thousands of years. I know, I know these things as rock snow burning in the sun's embrace, about clouds and sudden rain, as I know a cloud is a cloud. A cloud is this uncertain pulse that sits over my heart. So again, the mountain continues to claim that it is representative of anything between the harsh climate of you know, uh, a desert to the cool and breezy climate of uh, you know, a rainy area where monsoon takes place. It also claims that you know it is the wild bird in the west, perhaps that feeds on you know uh, human and animal uh, caracas, carcass. Then the mountain is also the past that repeats itself, the past that recreates itself. 
why it is repeating itself, why it is recreating itself is for the fact that it is like evolution that happens to the living organisms for thousands of years. So that's the reason why he says the particles of life that clutch and cling for thousands of years. Then the, the, the mountain claims that he knows, he knows, how the birth of life forms and the struggle for survival, like the ancient rocks, which know about the clouds, which will cool down after exposing themselves in the sun for a very long time. Then the mountain also understands that after a very hot day or for a, uh, you know, after, you know, uh, a few days of heat, there will be rain again. And he understands the different hues and colors of the clouds. And he also feels an unimaginable increase in his pulse, like what a lover feels when it sees the clouds, because the clouds will come, the clouds will become heavier, then the, the rainfall will be there, the rainfall will rejuvenate the mountain and the fill the Siang River again. So in, wait, 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 just wait. What is that? In in the in the end, the universe universe yields nothing except a dream of permanence. Peace is a falsity. A moment of rest comes after long combat. In this particular stanza, the mountain, you know, remember the mountain had been talking about, you know, all this tall, tall claims this very outwardly outwardly you know uh, kind of a talk then all of a sudden it gets down to the realities of life the sad facts of life in the end there is nothing this universe can give except the hopes and the desires of being permanent by permanence the point means never ending. Even though we get so much from nature, you know, we are never satisfied. We are never satisfied. We just want to play God. Why we want to play God? Because we want to achieve immortality. That's the reason why you have this cloning and, you know, other stuff. That's the reason why we go to doctor, because we don't want to die. But remember, what is that dictum? Uh, change is the on, only constant thing in this world, right? That is the dictum. We cannot achieve permanence. And peace, according to the poet, according to the mountain, is momentary. For a few moments, you may find peace. But rest of the life is filled with struggles. So a peaceful life is an illusion and no one can achieve it without a fierce struggle. Uh, we go to stanza number seven. In this stanza, we are going to meet a warrior. Let's read again. From the east, the warrior returns with the blood, blood of peonies. I'm the child who died at the age of the world. The distance between N and Hof, the star diagram that fell from the sky, the summer that makes men wave. I am the woman lost in translation who survives with happiness to carry on. So this warrior comes from the eastern side and he comes with this blood of peonies. It is suggestive of the obliteration of villages, killing of innocent, killing of innocent young kids, 
Okay. At the same time, the mountain is claiming that it is also the soil that died at the age of the world. It is, it is a reference to an Adi folk tale. Okay. If you want, you can look up. The mountain also serves as a distance between hope and apocalypse. Hope and the end. The distance between end and hope. The star diagram that fell from the sky. Another illusion taken from Adi myth. The summer that makes men weep. The scorching heat which makes you know, life miserable. I am the woman lost in trans translation who survives with happiness to carry on. In the beginning of the lecture, I told you why the mountain only speaks like a man and talks about man. And all of a sudden, towards the end of this, you know, uh, poem, in the in the seventh stanza, we get to hear about a woman. All the talk have been about man, man, warrior, man, the one who carries, you know, uh, a spear, the one, the man who comes with, uh, you know, a face as a gift. But when we get to hear the voice of a woman, this woman calls herself as a woman lost in translation. Why? Because she is the misunderstood one. She has never, never been understood and appreciated. But she, she, she has to survive. She keeps on surviving. Why? Because life must go on. If you obliterate, you know, sideline all the women in this world, this world cannot function. This world cannot move on. The soul will not move on. So life has to carry on. Life has to move on with happiness. Either real happiness or manufactured happiness doesn't matter. But this under, misunderstood woman keeps on surviving for life to move on on this earth. Last stanza, I am the bread that opens the mouth of the canyon, the sunlight on the tips of trees, there where the narrow gorse hastens the wind. I am the place where memory skips the mid of time. I am the slip in the mind of the mountain. From here on, you get, get to hear the voice of the woman. How many of you have uh, read uh, The Sorrow of Women by Mamandai? Sorrow of sorrow of women. Anyone? Anyone from IMD? Then you do sorrow of women. The sorrow of women in college. God. Anyway. So we get to hear this voice of a woman and she says that I am the bread that opens the mouth of the canyon. I am the sunlight. I'm the I'm the I'm the sunlight which falls on three tops. I'm also the wind, the strong wind at the narrow gorse. I'm also the place where memory escapes. Also, I am the myth of time. Also, I am the slave in the mind of the mountain. You will you'll, you'll notice that, you know, the poet suddenly turning around and talking as a woman, where her place in the grand scheme of, scheme of things is like asleep in the mind of the mountain. So you'll notice that, you know, the mountain has been talking about, you know, men saying much about what men do throughout the poem, okay? 
why the mountain is talking about man? The reason is very simple. The mountain is simply talking about man because all the achievements uh, which are there in the history of mankind are all achieved by man. We haven't written anything about women. Hence, history is still his story, not her story. At the same time, we also understand that the mountain has not spoken anything about women at all. Okay? Hence, she is that sleeping being whose trials and tribulations have not been written or respected. She has not been given her due recognition and place in the history of womankind or mankind, whatever you call it. But the fact is that everyone knows that she is there, but her worth and presence has never been felt. That's the reason why she calls herself as the slave, quote unquote, in the mind of the mountain. The mountain has so much to talk about women. But she still remains as an unsung hero whose potentials have not been unlocked so far and spoken about by the mountain. That's the end of the poem.